Good evening, Dungeon Masters, I'm Baron Durop. Dragons are so powerful that their existence influences how population centers operate for miles around them. But how, exactly? How would the various species of dragons, each living in their own respective biomes, influence and reshape the surrounding geography, and how would this geographical alteration affect cultural development? Dragons are terrifying creatures, sure, but their imposing fear isn't absolute as long as we aren't talking about dragon gods like Alduin, Tiamat, and Needhog. Population centers would obviously take a dragon's threat extremely seriously and would have defenses like bunker cellars, ballista turrets, and a standing professional army to defend against dragon attacks. Any spellcasting organization in the area would also train to keep the dragons at bay with spells like Sleet Storm. But how large of a population center could a dragon reasonably threaten? If we laughably use challenge rating and the XP budget as a comparison system, we can surmise a typical ancient dragon is roughly the same threat as 300 crossbow-equipped professional soldiers. To deduce a population center's minimal viable dragon defense size, we can lean into some guesses of pre-industrial demographics. Knowing around 3 to 5% of a population served in some sort of military capacity and these militaries likely had a one-to-one tooth-to-tail ratio, that is, one support role for every fighting role, we can guess a town of roughly 10 to 15,000 people would have enough professional military personnel to ward off most dragon threats. This also means that a village of roughly four to 5,000 people would have enough manpower in the event of a totally destabilizing dragon attack to equip farmers with short bows, track down the dragon, and slay the creature in its lair. Doing this would be a total doomsday operation, however. In an agriculture-based society, only once every 20 years or so, one in 15 adults can be called on for defense without causing a productivity collapse after the cataclysm has been dealt with. In essence, it doesn't make sense to risk half your workforce to kill the dragon if the community is just going to starve in a few months anyway. Even still, an ancient dragon would be wise to not harass any village containing more than 5,000 people. The risk of losing its horde and life is still too great, especially if adjoining communities who might work together to fight the dragon felt similarly threatened. For their own survival, dragons would likely stick to remote locations where they can prey off frontiers between larger population centers or the fringes of population expansion. Mining or fishing camps or any small people groups near remote, high-value commodity sources are the perfect potential victims for dragons to bully. People living in these camps would likely have prayers, superstitions, or even drinking songs to deal with the grief of living near such terrible creatures. Describe even has some great inspiration for this. What can we do when a dragon's coming? Hide your gold and get to running. Hope there's a mighty party nearing from over that horizon. Sung to the tune of Drunken Sailor will absolutely get your party hyped to kill some winged beasts. If you'd like to explore more inspirational prompts like this, including other sea shanties, check out the video's sponsor, describe. Visit the link below and use the coupon code BARON to get 10% off when you sign up. Now back to the video. While a dragon might be able to fly some 60 miles in any given direction per day and still have the needed time to hunt, eat, and rest to avoid exhaustion, a dragon likely won't travel more than half that distance from home. It always will insist on resting at or near its lair. Dragons are impressively covetous of their treasure hoard, and would never abandon that treasure for long periods of time unless the reward was worth the dramatic risk. With that said, mountains on the edge of a large plain, especially near some body of water, are likely going to be the most suitable locations for a dragon's lair. It's also serendipitous that of the ten dragon species found in the Monster Manual, six of them prefer roosting on high mountain peaks, high altitude caves, or on ocean bluffs. Dragons would likely live a few miles back from the flat plain area so as to make approaching their lair extremely difficult. They would use the forward bluff on the edge of their lair's environment as observation points as well. These observation points would afford the dragon views of the communities that they harass or oppress, and yes, 
Even good dragons would oppress populations with their entirely unbiased and infinitely wise definition of righteousness that completely lines up with the humanoid definition of morality. At any rate, from their mile-high vantage point, a dragon on a clear day could observe from a distance anything they could fly to in just a few hours. This gives the dragon plenty of time to make calculated decisions about what to do when it spots an army marching from over the horizon, sees infighting or raiding between the villages in its domain, or sees a party of adventurers approaching from a distance. Geopolitics asserts that the geography a community lives in has a direct impact on how that community adapts to life, and that those adaptations inform cultural, religious, and ideological development. For example, people living in a desert where water is scarce are much more likely to think that wasting water is a sin, and perhaps even put someone to death who wastes too much of it. In contrast, populations living in a mountain river valley would never worry about wasting water. A mountainous terrain's isolation forces people to adapt to being cut off from the rest of the world, and learn to make do with whatever materials they have nearby. An unknown and untrusted person who struggles past the mountainous barrier might steal hard-to-replace equipment. Furthermore, the geography where a community lives is the most static aspect of their existence, but in the presence of dragons, the geography around their lair subtly changes to reflect the temperament of the creature. Red dragons, for example, whose presence causes sulfur to seep into ground well water, makes downstream rivers and lakes toxic under this chronic exposure. As a result, pouring water through charcoal filters would become customary in villages even 10 miles from a red dragon's lair. Over time, entire religious practices or superstitions might develop due to this filtration practice. Spilling charcoal on the ground might develop superstitious behaviors like we have today with spilled salt thrown over one's shoulder. Likewise, children born with birthmarks that look like burns or skulls might be either venerated or ostracized depending on how the religious people perceive the birthmark's meaning. Alternatively, near a green dragon's lair, where its effect causes constant thickets and fog banks to form, mornings in a forest clearing which become blanketed in a thick fog might be perceived as a terrible omen. Additionally, any thorny vines growing on a resident's home or perhaps on the grave of a deceased relative might invoke fears of a dragon curse. Further, eating bramble fruits like blackberry or raspberry might be seen as making an unsavory deal with the dragon itself. Alternatively, a community living in a mountain foothills near a lair of a constantly smiling copper dragon might have a bizarre relationship with laughter. Children who aren't ticklish might be perceived as evil or soulless. As more people congregate around a belief or superstition, the more likely these ideas inform their ideologies, and may even inform deep religious structures. And the dragons know this. Over the course of a few hundred years, a red dragon's presence alone might inspire a charcoal-burning ritual-based religion run by a caste of birthmarked clergy, and therefore a much easier through-line for draconic subjugation. In essence, dragons would take up a lair on the edges of civilization, influence the geography, and subtly, over time, alter the very beliefs and worldviews of those who endure the dragon's presence. It's through this subtle influence that their treasure hoard grows, all with minimal risk. If you'd like to help me make more content like this in the future, please consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Thanks for watching, Dungeon Masters, and until next time, good night. Oh, and I'm saving the shape changers for later, don't worry.